What's going on everyone? Today's video is on what is an application programming interface or API. I'm sure most people watching this video have at least heard of an API and if you've been in development for any any period of time you've probably used one or maybe you've integrated against one or perhaps you've even created your own. When most people think about APIs, usually what they're thinking about is APIs that are that are RESTful and network connected. There's a second subclass of API that's that's sometimes overlooked, and it's the one that's present in pretty much every module or library that's that's ever been created. In the most broadest sense that I can think of, an API is nothing more than functionality you expose for a user to use when they're using your module or library or in some cases, your web service. When we're thinking about REST APIs, and for those that don't know, REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and it's a, it's a type of API, which I'll probably cover in a separate video. The, the full description of that is outside the scope of this video. But know that REST APIs, some of the examples would be like the YouTube API, Twitter API, Stripe API, or really any other network connected API that allows you to perform some function in somebody else's software. So for the YouTube API, there's a way to programmatically pull a bunch of videos for a given user. You know, for Twitter API, there's a way to programmatically publish a tweet along with an image. Stripe API, there's a way to programmatically make a charge. Note that in all three cases, I said programmatically for all of them. And that's because these APIs are usually designed for a computer to interact with it rather than a human. The second type is library APIs, like the JSON module for Python, that has an API. The net module for Node.js, that also has an API. And then Android Java core, you know, code, you know, people say they talk about Android APIs. Well, they're referring to, you know, ways you can interact with an Android device through Java. Now, even though the first three are network connected, but the second three are not, they, they both serve the same purpose, and that's giving a you know, exposing functionality for a user to perform some task in their software. When thinking about REST APIs, REST APIs are all about resources and actions that you can take on those resources. So imagine for a moment, I build a piece of software such as a to-do list. And for you, I expose a resource called lists. So this is where the verbs come in. For the list resource, I'm going to have to allow you to do certain actions. I'm going to need you to be able to read the list and create new lists, update existing lists, and then delete lists. And as I've listed here, API verbs, which are basically HTTP methods, map nicely to those actions. You know, so a get would be for reading, a post would be for creating, a put or patch would be for updating, and then a delete would be for deleting. And in this way, I can represent any number of resources with any number of actions, and I can allow people to integrate against that and perform actions within my software. So I want to show what I just showed you in kind of real live documentation for a REST type API. This particular software deals in customer relationship management. So you can see in their resources they have, you know, account and address, contacts, calls, collaborations, deals, documents, leads, and so on and so forth. That's their resources and the things that they're allowing you to interact with programmatically. So one endpoint they have, for instance, like I'm in the contacts resource. So if I run get on slash v2 slash contacts, it gives me all the contacts. So next one is I can create a contact. So in this case, I use post, and you'll notice that the URL is the same. And that's because you can have several different verbs for the same URL. From a web server and application standpoint, get v2 contacts is completely different than post v2 contacts. Then finally, to update a contact, you know, they're using put here, you know, so slash v2 slash contact slash, and then of course you have to provide the resource ID. The resource ID is going to be an ID that you'll get back when you create a resource. And then finally, delete, you'll notice the URL is the exact same thing as update, except it's with the delete verb instead. Now keep in mind that this is not specific to this software. Any properly designed REST API implements resources and lets you take actions against those resources. I just used this one because I thought it was clearer than the other ones. Remember when I said the JSON module for Python has an API? Well, let's go check that out. So now we're in the Python documentation for the JSON module, and you can see right in the second sentence, JSON exposes an API familiar to users of the standard library Marshall and Pickle modules. So if we scroll down just a little bit to say basic usage, we'll get kind of the beginning of the API. 
So the first piece of exposed functionality in the JSON module is json.dump. You can see that this method takes an object, takes a file pointer, and then it takes one or more of skip keys, indent, separators, you know, whatever. Now keep in mind that all this stuff is really no different than on the REST API having to provide, say, name, first name, title, description, so on and so forth for create a contact. It's the exact same thing. Now remember that I said APIs are things that applications expose for the user to use. So in this case, json.dump exists for the user to use, but there's going to be functionality that's internal to Python that users cannot use. And one of those things may be convert JSON format string into a format stream. So internally, json.dump wraps all that functionality up into one function for the user to use. So the final thing we're going to do is review a small piece of software I built that does something and has an API that exposes one piece of functionality. So my library in this case exposes one method that's called transform. And what transform does is it reverses the string and then uppercases that string. So notice that there's one function that's inside module.exports, but there's also two other functions called reverse and uppercase. So the only one that's part of the actual API is going to be transform because you're not exposing the reverse and uppercase functionality to the user. So if I were to write documentation for this, I would only document the transform function. But you'll notice that transform is an abstraction. You know, transform is not a real operation to a string. However, in this case, transform is the combination of reversing a string and uppercasing that string. And if anybody were to use this, they would see that same thing. So if I open up node, I do api equals require dot slash api, you can see it says transform function transform. Nowhere in there is reverse or uppercase. They can't use that. So if they want to use my api, they could do api dot transform, specify a string, and then it uppercases it and reverses it. So let's recap. Of course, api stands for application programming interface. APIs exist to expose functionality for the user to use to interact with their software, and that's true whether it's network connected type stuff or a module or a library. APIs only expose things that they want the user to use, but there may be a, a broader set of functionality that's internal to that software. Probably now that you've watched this video, you're going to be seeing APIs all over the place now. You'll be seeing them in documentation, you'll be seeing them on the web, and you'll be, you know, now you're looking for them. And we're done. Hopefully you have a clear idea on what an API is. And as always, if you have any questions, leave them below in the comments. And I will see you on the next video.